Hi, uh, everybody. Welcome to today's edition of the Spectral Geometry in the Clouds uh, seminar. Today, we have the pleasure of having uh, Jiao Yang, New York University, will talk to us about extreme eigenvalues of adjacency matrices of random D regular graphs. As usual, if you have questions, you can either unmute yourself or ask them in chat and we will relay them to the speaker. So um, the floor is yours. Uh, you can to thank you for the invitation. So the title of my talk is on extreme eigenvalues of adjacency matrices of random d regular graphs. So these are based on joint works with Roland and T and Yao. For my talk, there will be three parts. So first, I will explain to you some of the background on those random d regular graphs about the models. And next, I will explain to you my main results. At the last part of the talk, I will explain to you some of the proof ideas. So during the talk, if you have any question, just feel free to interrupt, uh, unmute yourself and ask me the question. Okay, let me start uh, with the background on random Dirichlet graphs. So, so for me, I consider those uh, random Dirichlet graphs, usually we denote them by G and D. So they are simply uniform measure among all the possible Dirichlet graphs on uh, N vertices. You can just simply think among all those uh, Dirichlet graphs, you uniform randomly pick one. Here, Dirichlet means uh, like uh, each vertex has a degree d. Like uh, this uh, this graph, each vertex has degree three, so it's a three regular graph. And uh, for me, I will study this uh, Dirichlet. So I will study this uh, Dirichlet graph from random matrix point view, just by view this uh, Dirichlet graph as a random matrix. So I will represent this uh, uh, graph by its adjacency matrix A. So if A i j equals one, if that only if there is an edge between vertex i and j. And then we further slightly normalize uh, this uh, adjacency matrix by squares d minus one. As the adjacency matrix A, it has zero one entries. And because uh, this graph is d regular, so each row sum and column sum of uh, this matrix is d. So this uh, matrix A, it has a trivial eigen vector one 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 with eigen value given by D. And after we normalize everything by square D minus one, the adjacency uh, the normalized adjacency matrix we denote its eigen values from lambda one until lambda n. Then the largest eigen value will be at D over square D minus one. And it turns out if we normalize it in this way, all the other eigenvalues from lambda two to lambda n, they will roughly be on the interval from minus two to two. And here is uh, the simulation for random four regular graph on 1000 vertices. So as you can see, the, the histogram for the eigenvalue distribution, it has uh, this outlier correspond to the degree d. And all other eigenvalues are roughly on the interval from minus two to two. And if we denote the empirical eigenvalue distribution of the normalized adjacency matrix by this guy, one over n sum over delta lambda i, then this empirical measure it converges to the, the measure rho d, which depends on the degree d, which is now called the Kenstein McCain distribution. And explicitly, this Kenstein McCain distribution is given by this formula. It has uh, this two parts. And this part, first part is just some factor depend on D. As the second part, this square root of four minus X square, it's a, a semicircle from minus two to two. And as you can see, this uh, uh, red curve, which is a Kenstein mccain distribution corresponding to D equals four, it matches pretty well with the histogram for the eigenvalue distribution for this random four regular graph. Even in a very small bin, and uh, you can see the density matches with the height of the beam. As the Kenstein McCain distribution, it's uh, the spectral measure for the infinite D regular tree as first discovered by Kenstein. And later, this convergence for the random D regular graph to Kenstein McCain distribution was proven by McKee in 1981. And here are some more pictures of this Kenstein McCain distribution for D equals three, this uh, red one. And for d equals five, this uh, green one, d equals eight, and uh, for d equals 200. And you can see from this picture, when d is 200, this uh, black curve, it looks really like just a uh, half a circle, a semicircle. 
You can also see it from this picture if D is really large, like if D is 200 or if D goes to infinite, because this measure is supported from minus two to two. So if X is between minus two and two, so if D is really large, this first factor, it goes to one. And what's left is only this semicircle distribution. And this was only proven recently by Tran, Wu, and Wang, and also by Dumitru and Pa. If for, for random Dirichlet graph, if D is not fixed, D, it grows with a size N. Then the empirical eigenvalue distribution under slightly different normalization, but still roughly normalized by square D. Then the empirical eigenvalue distribution, it converges to the semicircle distribution. And this is about the global eigenvalue distribution for the random Dirichlet graph. Now, for me, I'm mainly interested in those uh, extreme eigenvalues. And for random graphs, there is a key concept called the expander graph, which are widely used in computer science community. And the expander graph is a sparse graph that has a very strong collectivity property which means uh, it's very hard to break the graph into like this collected component. And uh, they have a lot of application like in design those robust uh, computer networks. And mathematically, the collectivity property is measured by the Chigger's constant, which is exactly the discrete analog for the Chigger's constant for Riemannian manifold. And for the graph, it's defined as a minimum over all the possible vertex set S, uh, S bar is the complement, and it's defined as a minimum between of the edges between S and S bar over the smaller component, smaller size of S and S bar. And uh, if, the, if the graph is uh, not collected, then you can take S to be one component, then the number of edge between the two is zero, the Chigger's constant will be zero. If Chigger's constant is bigger than zero, then the graph is, uh, is uh, collected. And if the Chigger's constant is large, then the graph will, it will be very hard to break the graph into two components. You need to remove many edges proportional to the smaller component. But in practice, to compute the Chigger's constant of the graph, it's pretty hard. In fact, in the worst case scenario, it's uh, NP hard. But thanks to this uh, Chigger's inequality, which relates the Chigger's constant with the spectral gap, the gap between the largest and second largest eigenvalue. So roughly it tells the Chigger's constant is the same order as the spectral gap. And, uh, and uh, for the graph to compute the spectral gap, which is just to compute the largest and second largest eigenvalue from the linear algebra, it's pretty easy to compute. So search for a graph with large Chigger's constant to, for the, some candidates of a robust network. Instead, so one can try to just search for graphs which has the large the, the spectral gap, the large difference between lambda one and lambda two. And uh, from the simulation, you can see this random four-regular graph. It has a pretty large gap between the largest eigenvalue and second one. So it turns out so for random Dirichlet graphs, they are typically very good expander graphs. They all have a large gap between the first and second largest eigenvalue. And you may wonder, for Dirichlet graph, what is the largest possible spectral gap? So what are the graphs with the largest uh, gap between lambda one and lambda two? And this question, it was answered by Alan and Bopana. They actually show for any collected Dirichlet graph, the second largest eigenvalue, the first largest eigenvalue is given by the degree D. Uh, and the R normalization it will be D over squares D minus one. And the second largest eigenvalue is actually lower bounded by two minus some constant over the diameter of the graph. And if a Dirichlet graph, if the number of vertices n, it goes to infinite, the diameter will be at least of order log n. You can think about if you take one vertex and the radius r neighborhood of it. And because the graph is Dirichlet, so roughly the neighborhood it will contain d to the r vertices. So for it to cover this whole graph, you, you have to take this R to be at least log N. So if you take plug a diameter is at least log N, then we'll have uh, asymptotically the second largest eigenvalue is lower bounded by two. 
So asymptotically, the largest spectral gap we can expect is just lambda one minus two. And then because of this, in the famous paper by Lubaski, Phillips, and Salak, they coined the words Ramanujan graph. It's defined for <clears throat> as a, the Dirac graph on n vertices. If all those long trivial eigenvalues, so we ignore the largest eigenvalue, which is d over square d minus one, and also we ignore the smallest eigenvalue if the graph is bipartite which is minus d over square d minus one. So we only look at those long trivial eigenvalues, which are strictly smaller than d over square d minus one. If all of them are less or equal than two, then we call the graph a Ramanujan graph. And in the same work, actually, the Basti, Phillips, and Salak, they give the explicit construction of this Ramanujan graph for the degree d, which is a prime plus one. And the, given by some Cayley graph of some projective with general linear group of a PGL2FQ. And in their, their proof, they actually look at the adjacency matrix, com compute a very high moment to show the second largest eigenvalue is actually bounded by two. And to show the Ramanujan graph, they use some version of Ramanujan conjecture proven by Will and Ling. That's why they call them Ramanujan graph. So the construction is only for Ramanujan graph, which has a degree d, which is a prime, prime plus one. Since then, it uh, remains an open problem for a while. Does there really exist uh, infinite families of Ramanujan graph for any degree d? And uh, this was only proven recently by Marcus Spielman and the Shirobata in their famous paper. They actually prove that there exist infinite families of bipartite irregular Ramanujan graphs by this two lifting. So here, two lifting is a, what I mean is a, if you have some base graph like this triangle, then you do a double cover or two lift of this triangle. So you lift each vertex to two vertices. At each edge, there are two choices. Like you can lift it to this two green one or those red ones and then just choose one. So then we will get a two lift of this triangle, which covers each edge twice. And their result, main result, uh, the actual proofs, if uh, the base graph is a bipartite Ramanujan graph, then see if it has uh, the E edges, then among this two to the E, two lift of this base graph, at least the one is still Ramanujan graph. Then in this way, you can start from some trivial, like a Ramanujan graph, like the complete the bipartite uh, Dirac graph, like the Dirac graph on, on 2D vertices, which has uh, the largest eigenvalue d over square d minus one, smallest eigenvalue minus d over square d minus one, and all the other eigenvalues are zero. So from this base graph, among its two lifts, you get a Ramanujan graph. If you keep going, you will get an infinite family of Ramanujan graphs. But uh, their proof is uh, mainly an existence proof, and uh, it's only for bipartite Ramanujan graph. It still remains a uh, conjecture. Does there exist infinite family of lamp bipartite irregular Ramanujan graphs? From the simulation, actually, it was observed for those uh, random theoretical graphs, if you take out, sample a lot of them, take out the second largest eigenvalue as smallest eigenvalue, they actually will modeled by the so-called tree Sweden distribution from random matrix theory. So let me just uh, quickly give you some introduction of uh, the random matrix theory and what are those uh, tree Sweden distributions. The story starts with uh, this so-called uh, Gaussian or circular ensemble. So which is the uh, n by n random matrix, it's a uh, real symmetric. And all those entries in the upper half upper in the upper half triangle, they are random Gaussian variables which has a mean zero. And we normalize them to have a variance. The diagonal entries has a variance two over n. And those off diagonal entries they have a variance one over n. As a variance uh, chosen in this way, so that if you conjugate this uh, also Gaussian orthogonal ensemble by an orthogonal matrix, the law does not change. That's why it's called the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. 
And because of this, uh, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors they are decoupled. You can integrate out the eigen uh, eigenvectors and they get the law of eigenvalues. If you plot the eigenvalues of this Gaussian ensemble, ensemble then you get uh, this uh, semicircle, which is perfect semicircle from minus two to two. It turns out uh, the largest eigenvalue concentrates around two, and the smallest eigenvalue it concentrates around minus two. And if you take out uh, the largest eigenvalue and then subtract two, and then you need to further normalize it by some, something depends on the size n, n to the two thirds. It turns out uh, this object, it's, uh, it's an order one quantity. And now we know it converges to the Tracy Wyndham distribution with beta equals one. And similarly, you can consider a complex Gaussian matrix. Instead of real Gaussian entries, they have a complex Gaussian entries. And then if you do the same scaling, you will get the Tracy Wyndham distribution for beta equals two. It's just a convention from random matrix theory, beta equals one for the real case, and beta equals two for the complex case. Here is a plot for the Tracy Wyndham distribution for beta equals one. So as you can see, it looks pretty similar to a Gaussian distribution. But the main difference is because the Tracy Wyndham distribution is defined by this relation. It's biased, the mode is not as zero. It's biased towards the negative axis. And roughly 83% of its mass are uh, on the negative side. And also these two tails, they are not symmetric. This uh, left tail, it goes to zero much faster, behave like e to the minus x cubed. And this right tail, it goes to zero much slower, like e to the minus x to the 1.5. So it's not symmetric. And this Tracy Wyndham, they are just first discovered by Tracy Wyndham in 1993 and 1994. By starting the largest eigenvalue of the Gaussian or circular ensemble, a Gaussian unitary ensemble. And later, this was uh, proven to be uh, universal. Like, instead of looking at uh, matrix with Gaussian entries, you can look at an n by n large matrix with uh, other distributions, as long as it's real symmetric and uh, they have independent entries. Like you can take any distribution you want, like the Bernoulli distribution, which takes value zero and one, each with a half probability. As long as you normalize them has a mean zero and a variance one over n. Then after the scaling, you always get to the Tracy Wyndham distribution. And this was the first proven by Soshnikov. He studied those random matrices. Each entry, the law are symmetric. And later proven by Tao and Wu, under the assumption each entry, they have the first three moments match with the Gaussian distribution. And later general cases was proven by Ordosh and T, Yao and Ying. And even a necessary and sufficient condition was obtained by Li and Ying. So roughly speaking, for those random matrices, as they have a bounded force moment for those entries, you will always give, get this Tracy Wyndham distribution. Uh, uh, I was wondering, is that the definition of the Tracy Wyndham for uh, distribution that is the limit of the GOE? Or? Yeah, actually, first, uh, this was the definition for the Tracy Wyndham beta equals one and two, because it's defined in this way. It's, uh, it's not uh, centered. And later, there are some other characterization by the Tracy Wyndham distribution. Yeah, okay, and, so, and is there a formula for it, or is it just for? Yeah, like for the first work of Tracy and Wyndham, they start from the red matrix. They have explicit formula for the density of Tracy Wyndham distribution, but given by some complicated the Friedholm determinant. So I will not bother you with the, with the, the definition. Uh, later, there are some other characterization of Tracy Wyndham distribution. Like you can have first have the area operator, like minus Laplacian plus X on the, on the positive axis, uh, plus some white noise. Then if you start this random operator, the eigenvalues turns out to be discrete. And the, the, the smallest eigenvalue, it will give, give you the Tracy Wyndham distribution. And there are some, per, some parameter in front of the white noise depend on the beta. Like if you actually a family of Tracy Wyndham distribution for any beta, not just the beta is one or two. And the, because of those universality results, 
It was uh, conjectured by Miller, Lovakov, and Savali, based, based on their simula numerical simulation. So the conjecture for this uh, irregular graph on n vertices. If you first uh, subtract two, and do this n to the two thirds rescaling, and then you need to further normalize it by some constant C1 and C2, then this object, uh, it converges now to the Tracy Witten distribution. And in the same statement, uh, uh, they can also they also ob observed the same statement holds for the smallest eigenvalue. This is for lambda two. Asymptotically, the two lambda two and lambda n they are independent. And here are the simulations for the GOE. The, I just sample a lot of them as a compare to the second largest eigenvalue. The red red curve is for GOE, and the blue curve is uh, for the spherical graph. So if you only just do the n to the two thirds scaling, they look quite different. But if you further normalize uh, them to have the mean zero at the variance uh, one, then actually they match pretty well. But still, because both of them look like a Gaussian distribution, it's still hard to see if uh, they are the same or not. As a consequence of uh, if this uh, conjecture is true, we do expect uh, actually for those uh, for this spherical uh, graph, this uh, blue, uh, this uh, blue curve, for there are a lot of them, they have lambda two is less or equal than two, corresponding to its uh, less than zero after this scaling. We actually have a lot of them, the second largest second value is uh, smaller or equal than two. Actually, we expect there should be a lot of long-losing graphs. But this conjecture is uh, quite open. That's because uh, here is, uh, we have the n to the two thirds scaling. If the conjecture is true, then it's necessary the second largest eigenvalue concentrates around two, and uh, it concentrates around a very small window on the size of n to the minus two thirds. And even to show this second largest eigenvalue it concentrates around two, it requires a lot of work. Actually, it was the first uh, conjecture by Allen. Uh, it was uh, proven first in the famous paper by Friedman in 2004. And later, a uh, shorter proof was uh, discovered by Bodinov. And this show for random Dirichlet graph, graph, if D is fixed, then with a high probability one minus little one, actually the second largest eigenvalue as smallest eigenvalue, they concentrate around two. And this is a story about random Dirichlet graphs with a bounded degree. Actually, one can also study the random Dirichlet graphs where the degree is uh, gross with the size of a graph. Was first a conjecture by Van Wu. So he conjectured if you allow the degree to grow with the size of a graph, as long as d is less or equal than n over 2. So d at n, they both goes to infinite. So we still have well, the second largest eigenvalue as smallest eigenvalue. The concentrates around 2 plus some little 1 times square root of 1 minus d over n. And if d is a constant, and we send n to infinite, this second factor, it goes to one. So it recovers this result of Friedman at body now. For Wu's conjecture, and even before Wu's conjecture, people have already started those uh, rapidly regular graphs, where the degree d, it grows with the size of a graph. First by Han and Nimerdi, by Cook, Gosen, and Johnson, finally by Tikmirov and Yosef. So their results, uh, first for d is uh, smaller than like a square, square root of n, and D is uh, smaller than n to the two thirds. And finally, for LED, let's say equals n over two. They can show actually the second largest eigenvalue, a smallest eigenvalue. They do not grow with uh, the degree or the size after this normalization. They're always bounded. But in their results, they cannot uh, see this uh, constant too. And my result is, uh, well, my research is trying to study those uh, random theoretical graphs both in the regime D is fixed and the D grow with the size of a graph. Try to get more precise information of uh, this uh, second largest eigenvalue and the smallest eigenvalue. Yeah, so far, any question about this first part? Okay, so let, let me move to the second part. At first, uh, in the joint fork with uh, Roland and he and Yao, we prove uh, Wu's, con Wu's uh, conjecture in the regime when D is uh, much bigger than one at a much smaller than n to the two thirds. We show the second largest eigenvalue as smallest eigenvalue. They, are, they concentrate around two, two plus little one with high probability, with probability one minus little one. 
Actually, we have some explicit, more explicit parameter for this little long term. It's given by this expression one over d d d to the three plus one over n to the two thirds plus d square over n to the four over three. And for this to be of little one, like for the first term to be of little one, when it's d to grow with the size of a graph. And for the last term to be of little one, we need d to be much smaller than n to the two thirds. So this is also, also of little one. That's why we get to this constraint, d is much bigger than one and much smaller than n to the two thirds. And uh, also in this regime, we can actually get the tracing random distribution after this n to the two thirds uh, scaling. But we need to slightly further risk restrict this d to be much bigger. It's actually just need to grow with the size of a graph n to the epsilon has much smaller than n to the one third. Here epsilon can be obviously small. So as long as this d, it grows with the size of a graph in some polynomial rate. Then we get the second largest eigenvalue, it converges to the Tracy random distribution. So this was first uh, proven Joint work with Roland at and Yao, where we require d to be bigger than n to the two over nine. And uh, uh, in an ongoing joint work with the Yao, we can pu we can push it to any n to the epsilon. And here we need to further restrict it to be smaller than n to the one third. That is uh, because uh, if this uh, lambda two com converges to the tracy random distribution. It will concentrate around the two, and the error will be smaller than n to the minus two thirds. And for this error to be smaller than n to the minus two thirds, so we need uh, this d to be to be much smaller than n to the one third. That's why we get this constraint n to the one third. And then we have a similar statement also for the smallest eigenvalue. And we all can also show that the second largest eigenvalue and smallest eigenvalue are symptotically they are independent. So in this way, we can somehow reformulate this result as, uh, as you can first take some degree, which is really large. And uh, the size of the graph, which is bigger than d cube, but uh, smaller than some polynomial d to the one over epsilon. So n, n can grow with uh, polynomial in the degree d. Then we will get, uh, because the 69% of the Dirac graph are n vertices, they have uh, all those long trivial eigenvalues bounded by two. So we get uh, the number 69% is because if you recall, the trace weight distribution is biased. So actually it's biased towards the negative axis. About 83% of its mass is on the negative side. So we roughly have 83% of those graphs. They have the second largest eigenvalue bounded by two. And we have the similar statement for the smallest eigenvalue. So we have 83% of the, the smallest eigenvalue is bigger or equal than minus two. And because they are asymptotically independent, then roughly we will have 83% times 83%, which is this 69% of those graphs, they are Ramanujan graphs. So although this uh, does not give uh, you infinite families of Ramanujan graphs, but it does give us a lot of Ramanujan graphs. And uh, this is uh, for those uh, random Dirac graphs, if we allow D to grow with the size of a graph. And uh, for the degree D, which is fixed, if you think about the adjacency matrix, then each row at column, there are only D along their row entries. And uh, there are fewer, there are much less randomness. And the problems about the random Dirac graphs with the fixed degree D, they are usually much more challenging. And for this uh, fixed D case, we can give a new proof for, for Friedman's uh, theorem. We can actually show the second largest eigenvalue and smallest eigenvalue. They concentrate around two. So I have a question, uh, yeah. Peter. Um, in, can you go back to this last slide? Yeah. yeah. The 69%, uh, in the work of Novikov at all, you, there was, as you remarked, uh, you had to renormalize to get Tracy Widom. Yes. In your work here, uh, so the Tracy Widom is the distribution. Is C, do you determine C1 and C2 or they come naturally for you? Oh, so in my case, if D grows with N, actually C2 just goes to zero and C1 goes to one. One, oh, okay. So but, uh, that, 
but in general, if D is uh, fixed, uh, I think according to their simulation, the C1 and C2, they should depend on the degree D. Right, right. I remember it took them a while to they could uh, match the two by finding C1 and C2. Because, yeah. uh, and it was not looking like beta equals one initially. But anyway, uh, when D gets large, just very slowly, you can uh, see C2 is zero, C1 is one. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yes, yeah, so like back to this uh, fixed degree D, we can only show this uh, second largest eigenvalue as smallest eigenvalue. They just concentrate around two with some error, like n to the minus C. C is some small number. And in the proof by Friedman and Bodinov, they use a moment, compute the high moment of the adjacency matrix. They can compute the moment up to some, the, the K, if you, they compute the, the adjacency matrix A to some power K, K is something of order log N. They can, can show this error in their proof. The error is given by some log log N over log N square. So we can improve this error to be something polynomial n to the minus c. So improve the log error to some polynomial error. But unfortunately, we can only take c to be pretty small. C is a 0.01. If the conjecture, the edge universality conjecture is true, then we do expect this c to be two over three. So there is a still a large gap between n to the minus 0.01 to n to the minus two thirds. So those are about the results for random Dirichlet graph where D is a fixed. Yeah, so far, any question, other questions? Okay, so next I will explain to you some of the proof ideas, mainly for this uh, random Dirichlet graphs when this D is uh, fixed. And the way we, we, the tool we use to uh, figure out the location of those extreme eigenvalues is uh, through starting the Green's function as the Stilchis transform. So let me just quickly recall this A is the adjacency matrix and we normalize it by square root D minus one. So in this way, lambda two until lambda n, the support is roughly from minus two to two. It does not depend on degree D. And because this is a self for joint operator to start its spectra, we usually, like in, in geometry we, or PDE, we start its resolvent and, or the Green's function. And for matrices, the resolvent Green's function is pretty simple. It's just the matrix H minus Z inverse. And uh, uh, this Z is on the upper half plane. And also, so another quantity we will use is the steel chest transform of uh, the empirical measure MZ, which is one over N times the trace of the Green's function. Explicitly, it's just given by one over N times the summation of one over lambda i minus c. So this Green's function, it contains the information of the eigenvalues at eigenvectors, but the steel chest transform, it only contains the information of the eigenvalues. In general, for any measure, we can construct its steel chest transform just by, by the integration of rho x over x minus z. As a steel chest transform, it contains the information of the measure. If you look at the imaginary part of the steel chest transform, like take z to be e plus i eta, as a, let it approach in the spectra, like sending eta to be zero, then from the steel chest transform, you can recover the measure row. And it turns out it's quite uh, mysterious to me. A lot of measures which naturally arrive from random matrix sitting their steel chest transform, they all satisfy some algebraic equation. Like if you look, compute the steel chest transform of the semicircle distribution, it's given the MSC, it satisfies this uh, quadratic equation M square plus the M plus one equals zero. And the other guy, like for the, what's related to Dirichlet graph is the Kinstein mccain distribution with degree D. If you compute its steel chest tra transform denoted by MD, then it satisfies this equation MD equals one over minus Z minus D over D minus one times M semicircle. There's some algebraic relation between MD and M semicircle. Uh, because the steel chest transform, it contains the uh, information of uh, those uh, uh, measure, we can also look at the imaginary parts of the steel chest transform of the empirical measure. 
look at the imaginary part of it, it's imaginary part of one over n, the sum over one over lambda i minus z. If you look at uh, the imaginary part of it, it's just the imaginary part of this one over lambda i minus z. So it's imaginary part of the denominator, it's uh, eta, if we take z to be e plus i eta, as an over the denominator square, which is lambda i minus e square plus uh, eta square. So each term, if eta is positive, z is on the upper half plane. So each term is uh, positive. And this quantity is uh, really the convolution of the empirical measure with a Cauchy distribution on the scale eta. So you can think this quantity is really, like if you take some, fix some eta, it's equivalent to zoom in, look at the spectra on the scale eta. So this eta is also called the spectral resolution. So actually what we can do is we can use a steel chase transform to detect the location of the extreme eigenvalues. See if we, we take z to be some eigenvalue lambda j plus i eta, then from the, this, lamb, this expression, each term is lambda negative. So if we only, for this sum, if we only separate the contribution from the eigenvalue lambda j, then this term will give us one over n times one over eta, something one over n eta. And the other terms are long negative. So we will have the imaginary part of mz, which is, uh, which is at least one over n eta. In other words, if there is really an eigenvalue as lambda j, I take z to be something lambda j plus uh, i eta, we will get the imaginary part of mz is uh, one over, at least one over n eta. In other words, if we can show imaginary part of mz is smaller than one over n eta, then we can conclude that there's no eigenvalue at the energy level e. So in other words, if we can have a very precise estimate for the imaginary part of uh, mz up to the pre precision, which is smaller than one over n eta, then we can use it to detect if they are eigenvalue at e or not. So that's the strategy we use to detect, to conclude there is no outlier. We will first get some very precise estimates for this MZ to show it's actually close to MD, the steel chase transform of the Kinstein mechanics distribution, to show actually the error is smaller than one over an eta. I use it to conclude there is no outlier. The way we, we to have the good estimate for this MZ is through to prove some self-consistent equation for this MZ. So let me just go back to the Gaussian matrix a little bit. I'll use it to illustrate to you how we get the equation for the steel chase transform MZ. I recall the steel chase transform of the semicircle distribution, it satisfies this algebraic equation MZ plus one over N plus MZ equals zero. And to show this M is close to M semicircle, we actually will try to show M, it also satisfies the same equation up to some small error. Then we can do some perturbation to show M seems circle is uh, close to MZ. If we denote the Green's function by H, uh, by H minus Z inverse GZ, as a steel chase transform is just the trace of G over N. And then first I will show you actually how to show the expect, if we replace M seems circle by M, the expectation of it is close to zero. So we will try to compute the expectation of MZ, which is the expectation of uh, this uh, GII, because uh, this matrix is permutation invariant. GIIs all have the same law. They all have the same expectation. So the, this is expectation of GII. So it turns out so this is GII, the Green's function at the ice, ice entry, it mainly depends on the matrix entries on ice row and ice column. We denote them by HI, the bold HI. At this GII, there's a, some, the sure complement formula, which tells you how to invert a two by two block matrix. Explicitly, it can be rewritten as uh, this quantity, one over minus Z minus sum of HIJ times uh, some GJK parenthesis IHKI. So his, he, here this G, G parenthesis I is uh, this matrix, uh, you start from the Gaussian orthogonal matrix H, you remove the ice column at ice row, get, get this H I, and it computes the Green's function. 
At this H i j and H k i, they, are, they only depend on the ice row and ice column. So in particularly, this H i j and H k i, it's independent with this g i. So this, uh, this just helps us to decouple these two sources of independence. And then we can integrate out the ice column and ice row. Roughly up to some small error, we can move this expectation to the denominator and then integrate out hij and hki. And because they are independent Gaussian variables, this come, the variance is roughly one over n. So it integrates them, we get the delta jk over n and some over jk. And this uh, is really the green, the steel chest transform of this gi, sum of, uh, so here is, it's reduced to gjj, parenthesis i over n, sum over j. This gives uh, the steel chest transform of this matrix with ice row and ice column removed. And because this is just a rack one perturbation, remove ice, one at ice row, it's only have a minor change for the steel chest transform. We can essentially then replace it back by the steel chest transform MZ. And then if we move everything to the left hand side and then take the expectation, then this gives um, it gives me expectation of M plus one over Z plus M. This quantity is uh, small up to some error. You, you will have some error by from this step and this last step. So it's uh, the same equation. So essentially, M satisfies the same equation as M same circle after you take the expectation. And to show, show actually M satisfies this equation without even taking expectation, we will try to compute the high moment of this observable. Like if we denote Fm to be like this, one over Z plus Zm, one over Z plus M, then we actually will show for some large number P, this expectation of uh, this equation, which now we can write it as M plus Fm. This piece moment is uh, small. Then by a mark of inequality, we can actually show M plus Fm is small. And by a perturbation, we can get M and M seems to close, they are close to each other. To show this uh, high moment, uh, this piece moment is small, we need to introduce a larger Gaussian or circular matrix just do with some exchangeable pair. This H tilde just uh, obtained from H by replacing the ice row and ice column by some independent copies, the bolts, the tilde HI. Then we have these two random matrices, random Gaussian matrices, H and H tilde. They have the same law as they, they form an exchangeable pair. The only, the only differences are on the ice, and, ice row and ice columns. So we can start to compute this high moment. Here, because of this uh, permutation invariant of the matrix, this M, we can replace it by this uh, any one diagonal entries GII. And then next step, we want to replace this matrix H by H tilde. So GII, the Green's function of H by Green's function of H tilde. Like it turns out because this H and H tilde, they form exchangeable pair, the difference of those two terms, they are small. They are explicitly given here. If you take the difference, it's given by the difference of the Green's function times this M plus F to the power P minus one. And because H and H tilde, they form exchangeable pair. So you can change H and H tilde at average the two expressions then you get, will get another difference, like a difference of this with uh, this M tilde is a steel chest transform of the matrix H tilde. And because you have these two differences at by perturbation, each, uh, if one is epsilon, this will give you uh, epsilon square, which is uh, you gain some, some control on the error term. So because of this trick, it turns out uh, this replacement will give you some very small error. And then after you replace H by H tilde, because only H tilde depends on this uh, bold H tilde, then we can integrate out the ice column or and ice row of H tilde, exactly as in the last slides. For this expectation, we will get uh, this uh, minus Fm, the one over Z plus N.
and we play and the move it to the left hand side, then we actually get the expectation for the peace moment of this m plus fm is uh, small. So that's how we get uh, the semicircle distribution, the concentration of semicircle distribution for the Gaussian or Sokol ensemble. And for the random irregular graph, we will also try to mimic this uh, argument just to show there's some observable, the, some high moment of it, it's uh, close uh, to zero. And the to get the empirical measure is close to the casting mechanical distribution. Uh, what, what, si what size of P do you need for this proof? Oh, so for this proof, actually, we don't need to take very high moments. Here, P, P will be any large constant. Uh, for arbitrary large constant will be enough. Actually, we will show this is uh, smaller than one over n eta to the p. And uh, even if p is just constant, we can show this uh, error is some one over n eta time, uh, times n to some epsilon. That will be enough to detect the largest eigenvalue or the second largest eigenvalue. Yeah, somehow this avoids to compute really log moment up to the log n. So let's Go back to the random Dirichlet graphs. There are some properties of random Dirichlet graphs we need to use. One is uh, if you look at uh, some radio, large radius neighborhoods, which can be of size log n, then for most of those neighborhoods, you they will be just a tree, exactly a truncated Dirichlet tree. They will not have any cycles. And even if for those neighborhoods, they will have cycles, they don't have too many cycles. You can just condition them actually with high probability, each neighborhood will contain at, at most one cycles. So each neighborhood, it's a tree-like graph, maybe contain zero cycles or one cycles. And we will need uh, this property for this uh, D-regular graphs with the degree D is fixed. And if you look at uh, the Green's function, just by some, some Taylor expansion, formally you can write it uh, as uh, this, uh, one over z plus h over z square plus h square z cube and keep going. If you look at the ij's entry of this formal expansion, this hij is just a pass from vertex i to j of length one, h square is, gives a pass from vertex i to j of length two. So you can think the Green's function, the ij's entry is just some weighted sum of the pass from vertex i to vertex j. And if you think it in this way, if we want to compute the Green's function as some vertex O, G O O, then we need to count the sum over all the weighted paths from vertex O to itself. And for those paths, if we take some neighborhood T of the vertex O, it will either stay completely in the neighborhood or it will leave this neighborhood and come back. But it turns out uh, the main contribution for those paths will be those paths which leave this neighborhood at some vertex j and then come back exactly at the same vertex j. Otherwise, if it come back at, from another vertex, then you will have a large cycle, but uh, which, uh, which happens with a very small probability at the, not, uh, at the for most of the vertex, most of the vertex O, oh, this uh, large cycle, it does not happen. If the main contribution is from the path which leaves the vertex J and come back from the vertex J, then we can actually first sum over this contribution for those paths which starts from J and then come back to this, uh, this vertex J. If you sum up for those paths, it turns out it's uh, exactly the Green's function at the GJJ, the Green's function with the graph, for the graph with this neighborhood T gets removed. So it's uh, exactly the GJJ with the Green's function with the neighborhood T gets removed. And you can further approximate it by this uh, GJJ, the Green's function with only the vertex I gets removed. So because you can think any, any if you compute this GJJ I, the path starts from J and come back to J, which does not uh, pass through the vertex I, because uh, most of the, the neighborhood, if it does not uh, contain a cycle, then this, uh, this path, uh, they will not enter this neighborhood T at all. That's why we can approximate it by GJJI. So in other words, when you want to compute the Green's function GOO, 
you can approximate it by the Green's function of this uh, truncated graph with some weights GJI attached to the boundary vertices. Because of this, we can introduce this uh, following quantity. It's just uh, the average of all the quantity GJI, where I and J, they are labeled to each other because they are n times d directed edges. So we further normalize it by the factor one over n d. And now if we want to compute the Green's function as the JJ's entry with the vertex i gets removed, we can do the same thing as the last slides, take a neighborhood. Now this vertex i is, uh, was removed and then replace this boundary, uh, replace uh, what's outside this neighborhood just by some boundary weight given by this q. And because for most of uh, these vertices, they have three neighborhoods. And the remove one vertex, they, they are called the d minus one array tree. Each vertex has a d minus one children. So we will get roughly this recursion for this quantity q. It's given by one over dn times sum of gjji. And for each of these gjji, we can approximate it by the Green's function of this truncated d minus one array tree with a boundary weight q attached to the boundary. So which is exactly some, some deterministic function you can compute using this uh, truncated d minus one or d minus one array tree. It's some function depends on it's some function depends on depth. So we denote it by f. That's why we that's how we get uh, this uh, this uh, self-consistent equation of this quantity q. Q is roughly given by this fq. So this is uh, the equation we will use uh, for the for the regular graph. And the fixed point for this equation turns out to be the Stilch's transform of the semicircle distribution, m equals f of m semicircle. But uh, this is a purely a heuristic, even, even the first step is not rigorous because if z is very close to the spectra, this expansion, it does not converge at all. And to make uh, this uh, more rigorous, we will use uh, some randomness of the Dirichlet graph. And the way we use the randomness is through this uh, simple switching. So which is uh, this uh, very simple procedure, essentially just take two edges from the graph, V1, V2, at V3, V4. And then you remove these two edges and replace it by V1, V4 at V2, V3. So as you can see, at, uh, just this procedure removes two edges and, uh, and uh, put back two other edges. It preserves the degree. Each vertex, it still has degree D. And more importantly, it preserves uh, the underlying measure, the uniform measure of the Dirichlet graph. They were first introduced by Marquis, and he used it to count the number of Dirichlet graphs, a count the number of uh, Dirichlet graphs, which uh, contain certain subgraphs. As a way, we will use this simple is uh, we will use it to just randomize the boundary edges of uh, some neighborhood T. Here, if we just uh, fix uh, some neighborhood T, and uh, it has uh, a lot of boundary edges. And for each of those boundary edges, we will do a simple switching. And for each of the boundary edges, we randomly pick another edge in the remaining of the graph. And for this one, pick this guy, this one, pick this guy. And for each of those pairs, we do a simple switch and just uh, remove them and uh, replace them by those two red edges for each of the pair. So you can roughly think it uh, as a, first uh, we fix some neighborhood T, then we just remove this neighborhood, just take it out from the graph. And then we replant this, uh, this neighborhood uh, back into some new, new locations, some randomly picked new locations. Because I have told you for most uh, vertices, they have a tree neighborhood. So if you replant this back into those uh, new, new locations, like uh, this, this uh, vertices will be the new boundary vertices. So with high probability, all of them will have uh, roughly a tree neighborhood. So the boundary effect after this uh, Resampling, uh, resampling procedure, the boundary effect will more like attaching to, to the boundary vertices of infinite irregular tree. The boundary effect will be more like that quantity Q. 
So that's how we really make a recipe proof. That's a equation for that quantity Q. Q is roughly Q equals FQ. And this also give us an exchangeable pair. If we have this original graph G, as the graph from the local recycling, we get this G tilde. And both G and G tilde, they are uniform distributed. And more importantly, this uh, simple switching, if you do it uh, twice, if you do the simple switching for this uh, two red edges, you will get back to this uh, two black edges. So actually it's a form of involution. Actually the, that gives the G, G tilde, uh, G tilde G, actually they form an exchangeable pair. If you change them, the law does not change. So it's a mimic that uh, in the argument for the Gaussian matrix, we have H and H tilde. And now we can really compute the high moments of this, uh, this Q to minus FQ to the power P. And we first uh, compute the first part, Q times Q minus FQ to the power P minus one. Uh, again, because of the permutation invariant, we can replace this Q by just one term, this GJGI. And next, use uh, this exchangeability, we can replace this G by G tilde. This will introduce some error, but the error turns out to be small. We can control the error. And now, now we can, can integrate out, go from G to the G tilde. It's, uh, it's from, we have the extra randomness, just randomize the boundary edges. So here, if we integrate out the rat randomness from just a random pick those edges to this local re resampling, then it turns out this quantity, the Green's function at the center, if you integrate out the randomness from this simple switching procedure, you will get this FQ. That's how we get back to the equation. If we move for this to the left-hand side, then we we'll get this expectation of Q to the FQ, Q minus FQ to the P is small. And once we have this quantity Q, then we can use it to compute the Green's function at each root vertex against the steel chest transform. At the, at the end, we will get the steel chest transform of the Dirichlet graph. It's close to the steel chest transform of the kinstein mccain distribution. And their difference is smaller than one over an eta. I use it, we can detect the location for the second largest eigenvalue. I get it bounded by two plus n to the minus c. So that's how we prove the, the concentration for the second largest eigenvalue. Yeah, I think I can stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have time for a few questions, let me see. Um, anyone can come forward. If we look at the second or uh, third largest eigenvalue, maybe joint distribution, I, you also expect uh, the same result as for uh, like Gaussian random matrices. Yeah, actually, exactly. Like uh, it's if you look at uh, the for the Dirichlet graph, if you look at uh, actually in the result, we can show not only the second largest eigenvalue. If you look at uh, the third eigenvalue, fourth eigenvalue, and it's a point process. This point process, it uh, converges to the, I think now it's called the, 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 the array, array process, which is uh, also the scaling limit for the, the, if you do the same thing for the Gaussian or circular ensemble, take out the first, uh, second, third uh, eigenvalues, it's an uh, infinite point process, the two are the same. And even you can also go into the spectra, look at the eigenvalues, not close to the, the largest, not to the extreme eigenvalue, but eigenvalues inside the bulk. And if you look at the gaps for the eigenvalues inside the bulk, like the distance between two, two adjacent eigenvalues. And the, the conjecture is a conjecture by Peter Sarnak and the, his collaborators. Also, this quantity, it should have the same law as the, the eigenvalue gaps of the Gaussian or Sogl ensemble. Yeah, there, the two are really there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of simu, simu, from the simu, simulations. The two are really you, it's hard to distinguish them from just look at those uh, local eigenvalue statistics. Quite uh, mysterious, but that's also pretty open, like the the bulk universality and the edge universality. Someone else have a question? A question? Yeah, of course. Uh... How about the eigenvectors, which correspond to like lambda two, lambda three, and so on? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, there's a result by, if you look at a irregular graph, even for a deterministic sequence of the irregular graph, the, if you, that if you take out the, take out the almost, uh, even just for almost eigenvector, if you have a sequence of uh, the irregular graph goes to infinite, and you just uh, take out each, take out the uh, eigen eigenvector, you can ask, uh, you can lift the eigenvector to the universal cover, which is an infinite irregular tree. You can lift their eigenvalue, eigenvectors to the universal cover. You will get some process on the universal cover. And it was proven in the paper by, I think, Buckhouse and ZGD. You can show actually this, uh, this process converged to some Gaussian wave. Which is yeah, yeah, to, to, to run the wave on a tree, but but uh, the eigenvector for lambda two and lambda three, right? I mean, uh, can you do it for uh, you know the these because th this is not uh, you know uh, uh, this is not you know quantum ergodicity. This is not almost all eigenvectors. This is an eigenvector for some fixed lambda. So oh, oh, actually we can do actually we can do a random pro probabilistic version of uh, quantum unique ergodicity. If you just take a Take a uh, fix some vertex set i, and uh, just take out take out uh, just a random sample of the irregular graph, and uh, you can ask uh, and take out uh, eigenvector. You can ask uh, what is the mass on the set vertex set i. We can show with hyperbit the mass will be like n, like uh, the mass times n will be the total number of vertices in this mm -hmm. set i. Okay, okay. So you can get uh, like uh, for most of the graph. Quantum unique ergodicity holds for the uh, random irregular graphs, and the, for for the degree d, which uh, grows with the size of the graph, I think there there are some some work uh, which uh, which shows uh, if you look at the eigenvector, only look at one entry risk at the entry square, rescale it by a factor n. This quantity converges the Gaussian square. It's only for degree d, which is uh, which grows with the size of the graph. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could say in a few words how you prove the independence of the two sites of the of lambda two and lambda n. Oh, so the proof of yeah proof of the proof of for the universality is uh, we have the adjacency matrix and we want we also have the Gaussian matrix. We just interpolate the adjacency matrix as the Gaussian matrix. Actually, I think we have one more slide at the end. I find the hidden slide. <laughs> yes. So we do this interpolation of the the edge is the adjacency matrix. This is uh, some Gaussian matrix. As, as you can see, if t is a zero, we have the adjacency matrix. If t is infinite, we have the Gaussian matrix. Well, maybe here we need to further to make the structure more compatible. We need to take a Gaussian matrix, you condition row sums and the column sums to be zero. And the use uh, this uh, concentration, use this concentration of the largest, second largest eigenvalue, combining our previous work by Ben et at Yao. You can show actually for any matrix here, you don't need it to be a distance matrix, it's for any matrix. As long as you have some control for the second largest eigenvalue, if T is sufficiently large, T is bigger than n to the minus one third plus epsilon, then this guy, the second largest eigenvalue, converges to the Tracy Weidman distribution. And for their proof, actually, the proof of this study, the, this process, it induces some dynamic on the eigenvalues. It's called the Dyson. Dyson Brownian motion, it's uh, some stochastic differential equation for the eigenvalues. And uh, when they analyze this Dyson Brownian motion, they can just localize, only look at the, the very small dynamic of the first few eigenvalues. They can show actually for this dynamic, up to some small time, it reaches, uh, it gives you the Tracy rhythm. Because uh, for this, to analyze this dynamic, they just uh, localized. It's only something about the first uh, n to the epsilon eigenvalues. It's the independent of the smallest eigenvalue. And you can do the same thing for the smallest eigenvalue. So essentially for this, 
for this guy, you can show the second largest eigen value as the smallest eigen value. They all convert to the Tracy Widom distribution as they are asymptotically independent. And the, what our contribution is that we can show actually the, do some, to do some comparison. Because this dynamic, you can think this dynamic every time you inject some small Gaussian noise. And another dynamic you can study for the steering gear graph is uh, from that simple switching. You can every time just pick two edges to a simple switching. So this also induces a dynamic on the steering gear graph, which, uh, which preserves uh, the underlying measure. Actually, when you really want to sample a steering gear graph, you can use that Markov process every time you pick two edges and do a simple switching. And what we can do is uh, we can show this uh, this dynamic by the simple switching and this dynamic from injecting the Gaussian noise. Both of them, you can write down the generator. You can do some expansion of the generator. The two generators, they match up to the order one over D. So if, uh, if D is large, the two generator, the difference will be small, like one over D. And then we can show the time T, more precisely, it should be N to the minus one third times D. This, uh, the two dynamics uh, are essentially the same. So both of them has, has, if, has the tracy Widom distribution if D is bigger than N to the epsilon. As they are asymptotically awesome, awesome, independent, the second largest eigenvalue as small as. Okay, thank you. It's quite surprising to me because you we always say uh, when studying spectral gap problems that the spectral gap measures Chigo constants and things like that, like how, um, how it's easy to cut the graph, but I guess we talk about the top of the spectrum in this case. And uh, so it means it's really measuring something else, the other spectral gap on the other side. I'm assuming bipartitness or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so that's quite surprising to me because uh, on, off the top of my head, I would have imagined that these two were kind oh, of- Oh, but that's a partitioning is only if the graph has a structure. Then, mm -hmm. then the second largest eigenvalue will be not will be close. There will will be close to the largest one, as the the corresponding eigen vector will contain some information of uh, how to partition the graph into two parts. But for a random theory graph, there is no cluster structure, so you should think uh, this uh, lambda two is uh, purely random, and its uh, eigen vector is also random. There is no structure. Thank you. Uh, I'll stop talking now. Is there someone else who had a question? Um, okay. Uh, well, we meet again next week. Uh, well, first we can thank the speaker again. For thank you for the invitation.